Good afternoon. My name is, uh, is Tim Druin. I'm um, Executive Associate Dean of the School of uh, Dentistry. But I'm here today in my role as a member of the Education Corps of the Institute of Translational Health Sciences to welcome you to our first interdisciplinary Grand Rounds. The Institute of Translational Health Sciences is a multi-institutional multi organization funded by NIH to encourage and enable interdisciplinary translation, uh, translational research among investigators at several institutions um, in um, Seattle and in the Pacific Northwest. Um, some of the partner institutions in the ITHS include all the health sciences schools at UW, Seattle Children's, Fred Hutch Cancer Research Center, Group Health Research Institute, and multiple other research organizations uh, in Seattle, plus other universities participating in the WAMI program of the medical school. The ITHS Education Corps sponsors training programs for researchers, but we also look for opportunities to educate others on the nature and value of interdisciplinary work in translating research findings from laboratory to clinical practice and to health policy. So to that end, we will periodically sponsor presentations called Interdisciplinary Grand Rounds to showcase how a multidisciplinary approach is often needed to address a health issue. What may at first seem straightforward upon further examination can become uh, complex and confusing. Views from multiple disciplines may be needed. What better example, though, to illustrate um, a multidisciplinary approach to a health issue than the recent controversy regarding revised guidelines for the use of mammography in screening for breast cancer, especially for women in their 40s. Hailed by some as overdue changes based on solid evidence, denounced by others as illogical and dangerous, and if implemented earlier would have led to the deaths of many women who are now breast cancer survivors, I don't recall a recent health issue where there was more controversy and confusion created by efforts to translate science into practice and policy. So to address this issue, we have an interdisciplinary team of outstanding scientists who work in the field. The team will be introduced by the moderator, so let me introduce the moderator. Dr. Joanne Elmore is professor of medicine and head of general internal medicine at Harborview Medical Center, as well as adjunct professor of epidemiology. As a clinician and epidemiologist with interest in breast cancer screening, she has unique credentials to lead this discussion. So I give you Dr. Elmore. These are provocative headlines that you've seen in the last few weeks. They result from the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force releasing their new guidelines. They were published in the Annals of Internal Medicine on November 17th, and this is the list of the panel members today. I'm going to give a very brief background, and then I'll turn things over to Dr. Al Berg, who is Professor of Family Medicine and the immediate past chair of the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force. So he has a unique perspective on what is going on here. I'll then turn things over to Diana Miglioretti, who's a senior investigator at Group Health Research Institute and an associate professor of biostatistics here. And Dr. Miglioretti is actually the senior PI that's leading a large consortium of breast cancer researchers that have provided data to the task force. This will be followed by uh, Dr. Paul Fishman, who will be speaking from a health services standpoint. He's an associate professor of health services, and I think it's important that we add that perspective. The final speaker will be Dr. Connie Lehman. She's a professor of radiology, head of breast imaging at the Seattle Cancer Care Alliance, and an international expert on the topic of breast cancer screening. Many women ask this question, should I be screened for breast cancer? And in fact, there's more than 50 million women in the U.S. in the age group who are asking this question annually. With a lot of the media, I noticed one or two 
articles and TV reports that I want to discuss. There was one on CNN where a woman got on TV and she said, I was 38 when my breast cancer was detected. She says, you know, I was speechless when I heard about these guidelines. I went in, I had some breast pain and a doctor found a lump. Two important points here. First of all, she's 38. We're talking about 40 and above. Secondly, she talks about having breast pain. I think it's important that I begin by differentiating screening versus diagnostic exams because the task force is not mentioning diagnostic exams. They don't want to discourage women from having diagnostic exams. A screening exam is when a woman comes in and she has no breast symptoms. She's hoping to detect something early. Whereas a diagnostic exam is when a woman comes in, she's detected an abnormality. There are a few different forms of breast cancer screening that were reviewed by the task force, breast self-exam, shown here on the left, the clinician performing the exam, film screen mammography, where you take the films and put them up on the light box, digital mammography, where the image is acquired on a computer screen, and then MRI screening. And these were all reviewed by the task force. I want to point out that all this provocative news in the media, it, it, it's actually not new. Um, and I think a historical perspective is important that there are many other groups that have made recommendations and guidelines. And in 1990, the NIH had a panel that spent a year reviewing thousands of articles. It was evidence-based. And this was their summary. They said that the data currently available do not warrant a universal recommendation for mammography for all women in their 40s. And so they, they began this issue of women should be able to decide. Now, the reaction back in the 90s was rapid and, and strong. Dr. Copens, a radiologist from Harvard, called the group fraudulent. Um, people that were the head of the NCI said they were shocked by the results. They said that it challenges the ethos of early detection. And the US Senate, who I doubt read all 3,000 articles, voted 98 to 0 in favor of screening. So this brings us another 10 years, and we're seeing similar headlines. And at this point, I have the pleasure of turning the podium over to Dr. Berg. Thank you. Um, first of all, let me reiterate that I'm not currently a member of the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force. <clears throat> uh, I got sucked into this because uh, I was speaking on deep background, I thought, with a reporter from the New York Times and was quoted in the initial article, many individuals assumed I must be on the task force and I started getting the, the emails that we can perhaps discuss later. Uh, but I thought I would at least start with a slide or about who or what is the task force. First of all, it's been around for a while, uh, 25 years. Uh, the principal audience is primary care clinicians and I can't emphasize this enough and I think this is actually the source of much of the confusion. Um, the audience is not patients directly, it's not insurance companies, it's not government agencies, it's not professional organizations, it's clinicians, it's the nurses and doctors who are seeing patients and helping them decide whether or not to be screened uh, using mammography or some other way. And the, the reason I think this is important is because that the language the task force uses, the word, for example, routine or, or universal, uh, is the clinician's perspective, which should be a message to the clinician to not just screen without pausing and thinking and talking. Uh, so in this case, uh, assessing individual risk and patient preferences. The panel is independent, it's advisory, it's non-regulatory, and no one needs to pay attention to the recommendations. It's multidisciplinary with a focus on evidence-based medicine and clinical epidemiology. We bring in consultants on various clinical topics, but the core of the group are uh, methodologists in clinical epidemiology, economics, and evidence-based medicine. And there's a very strict control uh, of conflict of interest and bias. I'm gonna briefly run through previous task force recommendations to illustrate one of Joanne's points, which is this really isn't new. And I'd like you to focus on the, um, the, the sense of uncertainty in each of these recommendations, starting with the one that uh, Joanne presented from the NIH consensus panel in 97. In 1989, the task force said mammography every one to two years is recommended for all women beginning at age 50 and concluding at approximately age 75. It may be prudent to begin mammography at an earlier age for women at higher risk and the clinical discussion then goes on to discuss uh, higher risk and the circumstances under which uh, women might be screened at younger or older ages. Uh, 1996 was the first year I was involved with the recommendation. 
The recommendation was for routine screening every one to two years for women aged 50 to 69. There was insufficient evidence to recommend for or against mammography in younger women or older women, but note at the end it may be uh, uh, considered for younger and women and older women on other grounds. Again, the issue of uncertainty in those age groups. 2002 was a recommendation that got me on the national news. Uh, the USPSTF recommended mammography every one to two years in women ages 40 to 69 years. Perfectly straightforward, but read the next sentence. The precise age at which the benefits from screening mammography justify potential harms is a subjective judgment and should take into account patient preferences. Which brings us to the 2009 recommendations. We're only going to be discussing the recommendation in the women in their 40s down at the bottom, but uh, the task force also made recommendations about teaching breast self-exam, not about doing breast self-exam, but having clinicians spend the time in practice to teach patients how to do it. Clinician breast exam, uh, digital and MRI mammography, and mammography in uh, older women. So here's the recommendation that caused all the furor. The USPSTF recommends against routine screening mammography in women aged 40 to 49 years. The decision to start regular biennial screening mammography before the age of 50 years should be an individual one and take into account patient context, including the patient's values regarding specific benefits and harms. This really isn't much different from previous recommendations. And I'll call your attention to the word routine in the opening sentence. What this simply means to the clinician is that rather than just ordering and not discussing it with a patient, the clinician really owes it to him or herself to talk with the patient about potential benefits and harms and make an individualized decision. This caused such a great furor that the task force reconvened itself in uh, two weeks and changed the recommendation. They removed the first sentence, left the rest of it, uh, and a lot of people said, oh, isn't this amazing? The U.S. Preventive Services Task Force changed its recommendation. Actually, it did not change its recommendation. It removed the first sentence. If you read the rest of it, it's still a C recommendation uh, recommending that it not be done routinely, that patients and, and clinicians discuss pros and cons before making a decision. Uh, so this is what it looks like uh, as of December 4th, 2009. And I'm going to turn it back over to Joanne to talk about benefits and harms. Thank you. The data that went into the three publications came from randomized clinical trials where they randomize women to screening versus no screening. There's hundreds of thousands of women in many different trials. It came from community data that Dr. Migliaretti helped to coordinate and from statistical modeling. This shows an example of just one of the pieces of data that was published, and I pulled out the data on women in the 40s to show the benefit. This is a meta-analysis. On the left, they list all of the different studies in the year of publication. They show the relative risk numbers for breast cancer deaths, and you'll see that they're all less than one. Um, except for Stockholm, you'll see the total at the bottom in orange is um, 0 0.85. This shows a 15% mortality reduction in the women in the 40s. There's a figure on the far right that shows uh, the results of the individual studies and also the overall results of a meta-analysis, which shows that for women in the 40s, there is a mortality reduction. Um, another publication in Annals um, that used some modeling looked at the overall benefits among women 40 to 69, so now not just the women in the 40s. And they found that overall there's a 22% mortality reduction. Remember, there was a 15% in the women in the 40s. They gave all kinds of numbers and statistics. There's 164 life years gained per 1,000 women um, and about eight cancer deaths averted per 1,000 women. Now, the task force looked at potential harms, and I think this is where some of the challenge comes in, and this lists the potential harms. Um, one of them is discomfort. This woman is smiling. Um, obviously, there's compression, and it can be briefly uncomfortable, but it improves the quality of the image, and it reduces the amount of radiation. Um, the radiation is much less in mammography than it used to be and far, far less than other imaging procedures like CAT scans. I put this slide up just to show the variation in types of uh, images. 
and how hard they are to read. Um, there are some breast cancers that you truly just cannot see on a screening exam. And one thing that the task force was concerned about was false positive exams. This shows the results when you take a few thousand women and you follow them over a 10-year period. You'll see going along from left to right uh, the results of this group of women at their first exam, how many of them had a false positive exam, meaning they got a letter in the mail that said, Dear Mrs. Smith, don't worry, but an abnormality was noted on your, your screening exam. Please come back for additional testing. Now, the additional testing may be just another diagnostic mammogram or an ultrasound, and a much smaller number go on to have a biopsy. But you'll notice that year after year, women come back, and after 10 years, at least 50% of the women have had a false positive experience. Now, I'm going to move into challenging territory here. This is another potential harm that the task force covered, which is ductal carcinoma in situ and whether we're having an epidemic of perhaps overdiagnoses. This shows visually what DCIS is as opposed to invasive cancer. DCIS, um, the little yellow things are cells and they may look abnormal, but they're confined within the lobule. They haven't yet invaded, as you can see on the right. And the question is, Will the DCIS ultimately progress to invasive cancer? And the answer is, some of them, yes. We don't know how many, and we don't know which woman. Now, we think that with the advent of mammography, we're seeing more DCIS. This shows the number of women that are diagnosed with new cases of DCIS by year. We started screening in the 80s, and you'll notice, boy, the percentage of cases with DCIS really increased remarkably. Now, if you're still wondering how do we know this is due to mammography, I have another slide to show you. This shows the results for women in the 30s, 40s, and 50s. And you'll see the results for women in the 30s represented with triangles. That's a flat line. You didn't see an increase because we weren't recommending screening among women in the 30s. But you'll see an increase in the women in the 40s and 50s being diagnosed with this DCIS. Now, remember, it's a pre-invasive cancer. It's not invasive cancer. Here's why we're, we're concerned about it. This shows what's happening to the women that are diagnosed with it. They're getting treatment. On the left, I show the types of treatment women with DCIS get, and on the right, the types of treatment women with invasive get. And in blue, it's the percent that get mastectomy. 30% of women with DCIS will have a mastectomy. I think it's understandable. We don't know if this is overtreatment or not. And it's, I think, a very challenging situation for women. Now, how do we communicate this? Getting back to that first question, should I have a screening mammogram? Let's take a woman in her 40s, and let's take 1,000 of them, and let's show what happens if you take these 1,000 women and screen them. I couldn't put 1,000 bodies of women on the slide, so this is 1,000 circles, and each circle represents a woman. You send them all to the Seattle Cancer Care Alliance, and the numbers in green, all of these circles, these women are, re receive a letter saying that they've had a normal examination, and I, I think they can feel good about themselves. They um, can be perhaps feel reassured. Unfortunately, up on the top right, you'll see a pink circle with an arrow. Remember I said, if you feel a lump, even, at, even though you've had a normal mammogram, please come in to have it evaluated. You know, mammography, we can't see all of the cancers on them. It, it's a wonderful test, but you know, no medical test is perfect. And indeed, some patients and clinicians can be falsely reassured. On the bottom, you'll see the women that have a false positive exam. Many of these women have a false positive exam. I've showed them here in black. These women receive a letter that says, please come back for additional testing. You know, we saw an abnormality on your exam. Now, of those women, two of them will be diagnosed with invasive cancer and one with ductal carcinoma in situ. So this is 1,000 women this week that we send to screening. Here's the hard part. We can always think about what happens this week, but what about over the woman's lifetime? So we're 2009, you have 1,000 women, but every single year you send them back for more exams. Over the course of a lifetime, a woman could have 25, 30 exams. What is the data then? So let me move from just a single exam to a lifetime. I want to move from the first exam for a woman to more than 25 exams per woman. I want to move from thinking about early diagnosis, you know, which is good because it kind, early diagnosis can be helpful, it can lead to easier treatment. I want to move to what the task force considered, which was mortality reduction. How many women have their lives saved because of screening mammography? This sh next slide shows the benefits and risks over a lifetime. If you have 1,000 women, you start them at age 40, and you screen them every year until age 69. 
Um, there's more than 27,000 mammograms, screening mammograms, that are obtained in these women as they age. And the benefits, remember, were 22% mortality reduction, 164 life years gained per these 1,000 women, and eight of the women over their lifetime will have deaths averted. The potential harms of these 1,000 women over their lifetime that had screening, 992 will have no mortality improvement. The majority of these women will have experienced a false positive exam, and about 158 will have experienced a biopsy, and no cancer will be found. So to conclude in a very simplistic way, I, I, I want people to know that evaluating screening tests is very challenging. It takes hundreds of thousands of individuals uh, in randomized trials. You have to follow them forward for 15, 20 years to look at outcomes. And what we're left with now is that the benefits are perhaps smaller than we had hoped for, and there are unexpected harms. And I think that the priority really should be to help patients make informed decisions at this point. I would like to turn things over to Dr. Migley Reddy, and she's going to talk about statistical considerations. Thank you. So Joanne showed you that, or Dr. Elmore, sorry, showed you that um, there, there is agreement that there's a mortality reduction in women 40 to 49. I should be very clear, it's a breast cancer mortality reduction. Um, and so a lot of people say, well, what is the, you know, what's the argument here? Mammography saves lives. Why do we need to look any further? Well, the issue is that breast cancer is rare in women 40 to 49. So while you do reduce mortality to breast cancer, mortality from breast cancer is very rare in this age group. And we could argue that maybe we should screen women 30 to, to 39 as well because we'd probably save one life. But once you start getting younger and younger, you start getting more and more harms of screening that, that no longer... Um, the benefits no longer outweigh those harms. So we need to look at more than just mortality reduction. So what the task force does when they um, look at screening and when they make their recommendations is they use an analytic framework for screening. And the first thing to look at is number one here, which is, is there direct evidence that the, the screening test reduces morbidity and or mortality? And we can say from mammography this is yes, even for women 40 to 49. But the story doesn't end there. After showing mortality reduction, we then need to go on and say, what are the adverse effects of screening and what are the adverse effects of treatment? And do these benefits outweigh the harms due to those adverse effects? So you have to think that for a screening test, you're taking a person who has no symptoms. So you're taking a person off the street who thinks they're perfectly healthy, who can go about their life, and you're making them do something. That in itself is considered a burden on the person. So you need some justification for making that person undergo the screening test. And if you think about all the possible results that person can experience, which I think Dr. Almer showed very well with her diagram, almost all of them result in harm with no benefit. So we can go through them one at a time. Most women will have a true negative mammogram. So they go in for their ma mammogram. Really their only harm is they were, you know, possible minor radiation exposure. It's pretty low. Um, some pain from the, from the test. The burden of having to get the test, the cost of the test, having to leave work. And there may be some benefit in that there may be some reassurance for that woman, though some of that reassurance could be false if she, if she's a, um, if she, she does find a clinical symptom. The next possible result is a false negative. So the woman goes home thinking she doesn't have cancer, and yet she, she, she truly does. And so the mammogram missed her cancer. Hopefully, if she finds a lump, she does go to see her doctor, and it doesn't delay di diagnosis. So there's no benefit for her, and there is harm. The other possible result is a false positive. The woman doesn't have cancer, but she is told to come back for additional testing. This is a pretty common result. Um, almost 10% of women at one exam will have a false positive exam, and the BCSC has found even higher estimates than Dr. Elmore. After 10 exams, it could be as high as 63 60 to 67% of women will have a false positive result. So that's just after 10 years of screening. And if screen, women are screening for 25 years, it's going to be, of course, much higher. So I think most women will probably undergo some kind of recall for additional imaging. You know, maybe that's not such a, a burden if it's just additional imaging, but some of those women will go on to, to have a biopsy. So again, these women have no benefit and they have harm. Uh, 
Another possible result is you have a true positive, but you have overdiagnosis. And this is a, a pretty important concept where had that screening test not been around, the woman would have never known in her lifetime that she had cancer. That cancer would never have killed her, and she would have never found that cancer. So these women have substantial harm in that they're getting pretty invasive treatment for something that they would have never known in their lifetime they had. They're getting mastectomy, they're getting radiation, which could hurt their other organs. So I think that's a pretty big harm. Unfortunately, we have no way of knowing who these women are. There could be a true positive, but there's no change in outcome had the woman been clinically diagnosed. So the woman comes in for her screening mammogram, she's diagnosed with, say, stage one cancer, but without the screen, she might have still been diagnosed with at the same stage. So there's benefit, but um, there's no benefit, but there's harm. And then the last woman is the woman that we really, um, the reason we do screening is she's the woman who has the mammogram find her cancer and she has an improved outcome. And this is the woman whose life saved and who so many people are saying, isn't it worth it for that woman? So she's the only woman that truly benefits from screening mammography. Joanne already went um, over all the harms of screening mammography, for, so I won't talk much about that here. The one possible thing that hasn't been discussed very much is screening fatigue. We know screening mammography works best in women probably 60 and over, works pretty well in women 50 to 59, and maybe not as well in women 40 to 49. If you start screening at age 40, then you know, do you get tired of going back every year, and are you less likely to go in for mammography once it's truly beneficial to you? I think that's something that needs to be studied. Um, so just briefly, one thing the task force looked at is this um, statistic over here, which is the number of women needed to invite to prevent one breast cancer death. And even though the mortality reduction, the breast cancer mortality reduction in women in their 40s and 50s is the same, 15%, there's uh, no disagreement there, the number of women needed to be screened with mammography to prevent one death is much higher at 1,900. And that means being screened for 10 years. Now you can see there's a big drop even between 50 to, 50 to 59 and 60 to 69, and I won't even, you know, I have no idea what the task force felt that this number, 1,900 was too much, 1,300 wasn't. But you have a lot more women, the 1,900 per, to screen shows there's a lot more women undergoing harms for the same benefit. Um, just briefly, the Breast Cancer Surveillance Consortium provided information on the results of, of screening, which Dr. Almer mostly went over and just shows if you screen 1,000 women, what do you expect for those women? And they looked at the number of women with a um, false positive exam. We'd expect 98. 84 of those went, underwent additional imaging. Nine underwent biopsy. So these are the numbers that you can use to see if you choose to undergo screening, what can you expect to happen to you over the 10-year period? Oh, I think this, I really like this um, figure that was published in JAMA just a few months before this task force published their results, and it shows the, the people who um, benefit from screening and those who don't. So this gets at um, something else we need to think about in screening, and that's le length time bias. Screening tests tend to find slower grow growing tumors that are less likely to, to kill a woman in her lifetime, which leads to overdiagnosis. So if you see, if you screen a woman annually here, you're going to pick up only the tumors that are slower growing that, um, that don't clinically become clinically apparent in between the screens. And so you're really, you're really more likely to uh, detect the tumors that, that are less lethal. Uh, this leads to, to overdiagnosis. And I'll just, these, I have the last two figures I think that I want to show is that if you had an optimal screening test that Optimally, you'd want to detect the cancers whether early stage, so you prevent them from appearing when they're late stage. So if you introduce screening here, at this line here, what you would hope to see is a large increase in early stage cancer, you know, maybe a smaller increase in um, late stage cancer that's detected because of the introduction of the screen, but over time, the late stage cancer, which is the line on the bottom, would decrease and the early stage cancer rates would increase. You'd want, you'd want to see more early stage cancer and less late stage cancer. In the worst case scenario of overdiagnosis, you're going to see an increase in early stage cancer, but no change in late stage cancer. That means all these cancers you're detecting would have never gone on to be late stage cancer. And I'll leave you with the last slide that shows what happens with breast cancer. It's, it's really a mix of these two where this is metastatic disease at the bottom, that's the worst kind of breast cancer, is really flat. After the introduction of mammography, we have not reduced the rates of metastatic disease. 
There's been a sm slight decrease in regional breast cancers, which are also pretty bad breast cancers that we don't want to show, that we don't want to find. And, but there's been a very large increase in localized breast cancers, and a lot of that is DCIS. So there is a, some evidence for breast cancer that we are, through screening, increasing overdiagnosis, and that is increasing the number of women who are diagnosed with cancer that would have never gone on to, to hurt that woman in, in her lifetime. And uh, next is, is Dr. Fishman. So I think um, Dr. Lehman and I aren't going to use any slides, so we think we've seen enough data and pictures for now, and um, hopefully we can um, move maybe more toward a um, less data-driven part of this discussion and more toward some of the consequences of what we've learned. Um, Dr. Elmo was kind in introducing me as a health services researcher. Um, full disclosure, I'm an economist, which um, I was a little bit reluctant to take the invitation here because of what that might imply about what an economist being on this panel meant. But um, I'm, I have eight minutes here, and I thought that all I would need is 30 seconds to say that the U.S. Veterans Services Task Force considered no economic or cost data, no cost data, I should say, in making these recommendations. In fact, they were precluded from doing so. So one of the things that has stressed those of us in the academy out is that there is the assumption that anything that the task force recommendation implied was to do with denial of access to care, reimbursement, finance, or the dreaded R word for rationing. But they're completely um, removed from any factor related to that. So I wanted to stress, and I feel an obligation to stress that there's nothing in the evidence, nothing in the papers published that were cited in annals that Joanne mentioned, nor in the recommendation. And I will say, I work closely with two people on the task force. I'm their economist, and I know that they wouldn't say anything about costs without talking to me. So, um, or at least, um, behind my back they wouldn't. So I, I think that it's important that for those of us in the academy and also for those of us as we all are of consumers to know that there is a very strong distinction between the clinical recommendations that are being made here to primary care providers and anything that would be of relevance to the supply side of this equation. And we've all read the subsequent stories about the occasional leaking through of people that are now being turned away from mammography centers. That was that CNN covered something of a upstate New York mammography clinic that was turning women away aged 40 because there was no evidence that this is a low income clinic. And, and this is, we have to be careful about, about how we in the academy represent this information. And, and I want to transition more now toward, toward what role that economists and health services researchers can play in translating this information into the actual delivery of care. My research in, in breast cancer and screening in general is focused on two things. Um, focused on primary prevention of, of, of all illness, but with a focus on cancer, what we've looked at at the Institute, and I should have introduced myself more. I'm, as Joanne said, I'm a professor of health services here, but I'm also a colleague of Diana's at the Group Health Research Institute. And most of us here, I suspect, wear two hats where we are doing pure research, but we're also touching patients in one way or another. So, and the third hat is that we're also consumers of this care, or we live with consumers of this information. And I think that when, when information such as the task force recommendations come through, um, and we're put in the position as quote unquote experts of trying to explain this, we, I don't know how you feel about this, but we wind up sort of moving into lecture mode pretty quickly. You know, you get into that defensive using words like population-based and evidence and guidelines and, and um, at home at least I get a, an eye rolling and I get a, um, that, that doesn't mean anything to me. Um, and I think that when, when I introduce the research that we do at the Institute that has relevance for this, we focus on several things. One is, why do people choose to get screened or not screened in the first place? So we have done trials, not about the clinical efficacy or effectiveness of the screen, but why do people choose to get mammograms or not in the first place? What information do they incorporate into their decision-making process, and what are the barriers to screening, regardless of whether or not screening is appropriate? But then, if it's appropriate, what then happens? And then the second thing we look at is, based on what happens to people, and we've looked at this with breast cancer in particular, but with other conditions as well, based on the pathway that Joanne and Diana have walked you through, how do people perceive their quality of life based on this? So 
we don't need cost information to deal with economic consequences because economics is really focused on decision making and why people make choices and harms need not be translated into dollars because we can have seriously negative quality of life consequences which affect people in a much more dramatic way than financially because of push pulling them through a trajectory a spectrum of care that may not lead to any positive outcome or as Diane Joanna pointed out can actually hurt them so and the first thing that I want to say about choosing to screen or not get screened about the work that we've done, and this is work that, that Steve Taplin led here, who was um, one of the originators of the screening program, who's now at the National Cancer Institute, is understanding that we have people that, even with the right information, don't choose to do anything with it. And um, as, as Al pointed out, the recommendation is supposed to prompt providers to gather and share information with their patients to let them make informed choices. And one of the frustrating things that, that I, I think that we experience as consumers and as people who touch patients is that we, and, and this is sort of where we need to look closely in the mirror, is we need to learn how to communicate how population-based information is translatable to the individual. So to say simply, and we know this to be true, to say simply that, well, only one in a thousand women will actually have a cancer. The woman, that's the one in the thousand, doesn't care about the population-based evidence. And we need to understand how to take this population-based information and put it into a digestible format so that we, and our responsibility as providers, is to make available information that's informable to the patient. And we do a bad job of that. Not everybody, but I mean it's the capital we in the academy do a bad job of that. And I think that, that having spoken to people on the task force, they felt that, that um, um, they were put at a disadvantage in how the information was going to be communicated. The second thing is what the quality of life consequences are. And we have quantified, as others have, the quality of life consequences for women on two margins of interest with respect to the screening, the healthy screener phenomenon. The first is the simple disutility, the simple lack, the, the, the loss of quality of life associated with waiting for the information the two to three weeks waiting for that letter, perhaps, the delay, can cause significant disutility. Even knowing that it's a, it's a, it's a positive outcome or, or a, a, a positive health outcome, a negative mammogram, can cause women harm. And we've quantified that they don't want to wait around for it. But not surprisingly, the significant harm with that abnormal reading, please come back in for a follow-up. And we have looked into this, and women it, it's more along the spectrum of decreased quality of life associated with treatment for actual malignancy when it's a healthy woman that's called back for um, a, a false, an, an eventual false positive result. So the harm is not mm, hypothetical or, 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 or um, sort of um, unquantifiable. It's real, and I think that we have a responsibility to let people know that these harms are not just, well, the discomfort. And I think the mammogram fatigue comes in when we may lose people when, in fact, the harm, may, the benefit may be there. The, the last thing I want to say, um, and this is more sort of the sort of personal editorial here, is that if, in fact, we're going to be able to give women informed and, and we're talking about breast cancer, but this is true for all, for all diseases that have screening tools, is that it's, always, it's, it's surprising to me that as much attention as this has been getting, almost no attention in the popular press has been given to legislation that was actually passed last year, the Genomic Information Non-Discrimination Act, which many of you are probably familiar with, the so-called GINA legislation. We know with certainty that when we're measuring high risk status in women, we need to know factors that contribute to high risk. And we know that first and second degree relatives are the things that are most likely to contribute to risk factors. Federal legislation, as some of our lawyers and risk managers are interpreting for us, preclude us from asking people about this information so that we can actually give them information about their risk status. That's not true for everybody, but because of concerns about insurance discrimination, which are legitimate, the way legislation has been written and because of the risk aversion of our lawyers and our risk managers, we may not be able to ask people if you have a first degree or second degree relative who has had breast cancer, regardless of your age, would be the most significant factor in deciding whether or not to be screened. So um, on one hand, 
trying to fashion information that's going to be most useful for women, but, but ignoring what is denying the ability of the healthcare delivery system to actually take this information and fashion, and fashion um, digestible and relevant data for the woman so that you can make the informed decision. And that's what I think the, what we need to pick up from the academy and follow up on these task force recommendations. So I think Dr. Lehman is now going to talk from yet another perspective. Well, hello, and I'm really pleased to be here. I think one of the fantastic aspects of the University of Washington is the focus on the importance of interdisciplinary approaches to health care. We're doing so much across so many different disciplines, so important to have an economist here, um, to understand how we can have better patient outcomes in a sustainable way, in a way that we can afford. And we're excited about that future. I want to talk specifically, and one of the questions that Joanne asked for me is, what do you say to your patients? How do you give recommendations to them? I could either begin or end with a statement that may jar some people, but what we say to our patients is please get a mammogram every year starting at the age of 40. Now I know if I start out with that first, people are going to say, what? You know, where did that come from? We were just talking about having a nice long conversation with the patients, explaining to them both the potential harms and the potential benefits, and it really sounds like we're going to emphasize that probably for most women in their 40s, this just really isn't indicated, but we don't see it that way, and so that is not our recommendation. I also want to be very clear that the American Cancer Society stands by their very strong recommendation that women 40 and older have a mammogram every year. Now why is that? These are very smart people that are looking at all these different studies, randomized clinical trials that have been performed, observational studies, much, much research in the area. So why is it that we have one group that is saying, well, we don't really recommend routine. We think you should discuss with your physician. And that's true of women in their 50s and 60s as well. We all want to have a dialogue so that patients understand why recommendations are being made. But why is there a difference in what then we are doing with women in their 40s and what we're doing with women in their 50s. Because we're not saying to women in their 50s, well, you should have a discussion. We're saying we, you know, this, this group is saying we recommend every two years these women have a mammogram. So we need to clarify that. And why is it then that in our conversations with our patients, we say, based on the literature, based on the research, and most importantly, based on our knowledge of our current performance, we absolutely want to see our women having a mammogram every year from age 40 and older. So one of the great resources that we have is the Breast Cancer Surveillance Consortium. A lot of women, when they heard these recommendations, said, I'm a little bit puzzled because it seems that much of this research that was done was based on older trials in other countries. And in fact, on NPR, women said, what, if, what about what's going on right now in the US? Well, this amazing resource we have is the Breast Cancer Surveillance Consortium. Millions of women with their mammographic records linked to tumor registries, and we can see how mammography is performing, and we can use that information to better guide women to make decisions right now on what they should do. And we know a few things. Where a woman has her mammogram makes a difference. Who reads it makes a difference. The Breast Cancer Surveillance Consortium has shown that people that have fellowship training specialized in breast imaging perform better in their interpretations than those that don't. Their data has also shown that academic centers perform better than those are, that are not academic centers. These are really important because as we're making these discussions, it's not getting a mammogram or not getting a mammogram, it's what kind of mammogram, by whom, and where. And that can dramatically change what you would model or what you would predict for outcomes. So everyone is aware that there's heterogeneity of performance with the Breast Cancer Surveillance Consortium, millions of women now in the U.S., that performance, as well as other studies, we have a lot more information to share. We also know that the type of exam makes a difference. One of the recent um, age studies that was looking at women in their 40s, it was all film screen. And rather than take two views, once they did the initial exam, they only followed those women with a one-view mammogram. Well, that's not allowed in the US. That's not how we perform mammography in the US. Again, based on the Breast Cancer Surveillance Consortium and other studies, digital mammography, and specifically a, a two-view digital ma uh, mammogram, is going to perform at a much higher rate in women in their 40s in film screen, and certainly a one-view film screen mammogram would. So who, what, where, and then when. 
We also know from data in the U.S. that women in their 40s undergoing annual mammography have better outcomes than women in their 40s undergoing mammography every two years. So when we take all of this information together and we know our performance at the University of Washington and the Seattle Cancer Care Alliance and we see our outcomes, there's absolutely no question that women should be screened at our institution every year age 40 and older because of the improved outcomes. So now let's talk about benefits and harms. The benefit that everyone agrees on, even when we take this mix of all different kinds of studies, one view, two views, film screen, digital, in the US, outside the US, currently 30 years ago, breast cancer screening with mammography saves lives. So we all agree with that. The estimates from the, as you've seen from the um, randomized trials, which is again, not women having mammography, it's women invited to a mammography program, so it's different. And we also have observational studies that compare women that actually undergo and participate in mammography and women that do not undergo and participate in mammography. So depending on the range, you're either gonna have absolute agreement on 15% reduction in breast cancer deaths or as high as 30 to 40% decreased deaths when women are participating in screening mammography programs. So if we're a high-performing center, we're looking for a significant decrease in deaths. There's some other benefits besides the decrease in deaths, and that's decreased morbidity. When I have a patient come into our clinic who we are diagnosing early with a cancer, and I remember Roger Moe many times starting off his lectures saying, I have great news, breast cancer can be cured. And that's what we can say to these women when they have their cancer detected at an early stage. The data is irrefutable. Stage zero and one is a 98% survival. Those women will be cured. That is how we cure breast cancer by detecting early at stage zero and stage one. When we do not detect that cancer early, as we move through the stages, as the cancer size increases, as lymph node um, involvement becomes more prominent, the women that are dying of that disease significantly increases so that by the time we have metastatic disease, we can no longer cure that. So important, early detection is how we cure these patients and how we cure them with a minimally invasive treatment. The earlier stage, we are not needing in nearly as many of those women to have chemotherapy and the morbidity and side effects of that. We can offer more women breast conservation rather than the more aggressive mastectomies. So both the decreased morbidity and the improved survival when a woman is diagnosed with breast cancer, the benefits. And then we work with our patient on those harms, the harms and concerns of the pain associated with a mammogram, the fears of a false positive mammogram, of under needing to go a biopsy unnecessarily. So we have also different ways that we can triage these women. If a woman comes into our clinic and says, I'm 45 years old, every time I get a mammogram I'm called back, we want to work with her more carefully. That's not our experience at our center. Sometimes the first mammogram a woman gets, she'll have it at our center while we can read it while she's there. If there are additional views, we take it then and she's done in one setting. The likelihood of her having another callback after that initial baseline drops precipitously. And from that point on, it's a much more steady approach to part of her routine health care is to come in, get a mammogram each year, and, and move on. So I think that this is the approach that we've taken and why and why we so strongly support the American Cancer Society. And um, I'm really, again, very pleased to be here to have all different perspectives shared. I'm particularly looking forward to the panel discussion and questions. Thank you very much. Now comes the fun part. Do we have a few questions? We'll take the first one here. Yes, thank you for being here. Um, I'd like to start with that um, I'm a breast cancer survivor, DCIS. One um, risk factor of having a child at 39, I happen to have no family history. Um, and the impetus for me getting a mammogram was it was part of the well, well patient program. Um, with the insurance company's group health that I was at at the time. Um, I changed my insurance at the age of about 42, nearly 43. I went back and had a second mammogram, and they found, uh, you know, evidence of that need, needed to have further um, testing. Um, so I've been through the biopsies. I've been through all those harm things that we're talking about. And... Um, I can, I can actually say that I'm very grateful that those guidelines initially were in place. It 
the age of 40 because I I'm, I'm, might have been that one woman who may not have made it had we gone to 50. And again, because um, no, family, no family history, I was quite arrogant that I probably didn't need this exam. And I can honestly say I wouldn't have got it had, had I really been educated on these new guidelines. My question is, and thank you for bearing with me with this, um, is in lieu of the fact that my understanding is 75 to 85 percent of women do not have a risk factor um, with breast cancer, why isn't this discussed more with the public? And why isn't this extremely important statistic being put out there more for discussion? And All right. that's my question. Great. Right. Thank you for sharing your story. And I'll defer the question about the importance of risk factors in screening to Dr. Lehman. I am, I am so, well, first, I'm glad you're um, comfortable sharing your story. Thank you and, and your comment. Um, we absolutely agree. We all want to move increasingly towards more targeted approaches to medicine and health care to make sure that we're targeting our interventions, whether it's a screening mammogram or a, a you know, CT for lung cancer screening or what a, assessing um, blood sugar and hypertension, that we really want to be very targeted in our approaches. And, uh, and we can do that to some extent. But just as you said, the vast majority of women diagnosed with breast cancer do not have one single risk factor. So we are not in a place where it's like, well, talk to your doctor, see what your risk factors are, see what you want to do. Unfortunately, 75 to actually 90% of women diagnosed with breast cancer have no known risk factors. It's an area of research, it's an area we can continue to pursue, but to think that that is how we can make these decisions about screening for breast cancer, we will miss the majority of breast cancers if we take that approach now, except what do we know? women, <laughs> we're not screening men, 40 and older we think is, although there's, it's always going to be arbitrary where we start, we think 40 and older is, and then women with a strong family history, so we can identify those women. But again, by doing that, that last group is a very small group of the patients that are actually breast cancer patients, and about 20% of all deaths from breast cancer are occurring in women in their 40s. So thinking that this just doesn't, this is a disease that doesn't happen to women in their 40s is just not based on the science. Okay, we'll take the next question. Yes, um, my interest in, uh, in this issue is really the risk communication problem here. It seems to me that it was a perfect storm of a risk communication problem, especially falling in the heels of the health reform. It kind of fell right into the hands of the people who were afraid of rationing. And I'm wondering um, what kind of assistance uh, the commission had in terms of the risk communication. And is there um, kind of a, a um, risk communication autopsy being done right now? <laughs> on what, you know, for, because we've spent years and years and years educating women to get breast, uh, get screening. And suddenly now there's what people see as a reversal. Right. So I'm wondering if we can have a discussion on sort of the risk communication issues here. Thank you for your question. Dr. Berg? I, well, I, I'm in almost daily communication with members of the task force that I'm providing therapy for. Um, <laughs> what, what I can tell you is that no one saw this coming. Uh, this review was begun about three years ago. The, the date of release was chosen by the Annals of Internal Medicine and in their publication schedule. The, ta the agency had not even prepared a press release for this because they thought the message was so similar to what it had been the last time that no one would notice. Uh, and as soon as it hit the fan, uh, HHS backed off, ARC backed off, and actually cut off task force members from support of the agency for further modification of their communication strategy. And the task force members individually have had to uh, come up with funds to to buy consulting services to help them uh, craft messages. Uh, so it, it was a fiasco in many degrees, but, uh, but not in the ways that you might have thought. Uh, the task force kind of did its work uh, as it has many, many times in the past and had been ignored mostly in the past, and exactly why this one hit the way it did was unique and the fact that the agency and HHS have pulled back and not assisted the task force in refining its uh, messages I think is a, a very sad commentary about uh, the current administration. We all complained about the last administration and their um, 
uh, suppression of scientific information. And the fact that the current administration would be doing much the same is very, very troubling. Dr. I have a slightly different take on that. I, I think it, I totally agree. The members of this um, task force, they're good people. They're doing hard work. Uh, they're not paid a huge amount. They're not invested in it for any of those reasons. We appreciate that. But at absolute best, the most generous thing you can possibly say is they were naive. I think they were extraordinarily naive to not think that this was going to get attention. And there were press releases. They were all prepared the week before. We all saw them. This was naive to think that this was not going to have an impact. And then to try to backpedal and say, we're not telling people what to do. We were just sort of thinking it'd be a good idea that they question or talk to their doctor again. I think it was naive, it was naive to label something as a, a category C and not to think that that would have any impact or that would have any message. So I think it is a brilliant time for us all to think about, again, as we have multiple disciplines, multiple scientists, multiple groups working on these complex issues and making recommendations, also how are we messaging and how are we going through with that. The timing was, was less than terrific. I'm actually so excited about the health care changes that we're seeing. I am so excited that I think that my kids and I will be living in a country where everyone has health care coverage. It is a right. It is not a privilege. To have this be a wrench dropped into that and have um, groups that are really opposed to more equitable health care use this um, to inflame people thinking that this would be rationed is it was concerning to me so i think going forward there are a lot of lessons learned by the uspstf while i will totally give it that they were just being naive we hope that going forward there are more thoughtful ways of presenting information i want to give a special thanks to these four individuals here who gave up their time and and uh, shared with us their expertise so thank you very much